Good afternoon, Year 6, and a welcome to the next instalment of Mr. Ford's Reading Time, Mr. Ford's Reading Corner, Read with Ford. I still not come up with a good name yet. But we are now on Chapter 6 of Gargantis. So, as always, if you want to just listen to me in the background whilst you do something else, feel free. There won't be much going on here apart from me reading. So, at the end of the last chapter, um, there'd been a kerfuffle from upstairs in the Grand Lost Hotel, and Vi and Erwin and Herbie had decided to investigate. So chapter six is called A Dismal Business. The light in my cubby hole is off. The lost and foundry is closed, remember? So it's easy for Violet and me to stay hidden in the shadows. We peer over the desk into the brightly lit lobby of the Grand Northless Hotel. A group of dishevelled people are struggling through the great revolving doors, the storm still snatching at them as they enter. I see at once that they are local fishermen, they're grunting and gasping as they carry something between them, something tangled in an old fishing net. Mr. Mollusk is wringing with his hands and dancing from foot to foot as he protests. This is an outrage! We are a hotel, not a fishmonger's. Take this frightful object away before I am forced to call the authorities. This frightful object, as you call it, says a voice I know well, isn't an object at all, but a person. A person in need of urgent medical attention. That's Dr. Talassi speaking, the town's medical doctor. He's also the curator of the Museum of Erie and a distinguished member of the local community. Not that you'd guess by looking at him now as he enters the hotel. His hair, usually so neat, has been storm blasted in all directions, and his characteristic bow tie is wonky. The spectacles perched on his Roman nose are streaming with water, and there's a strand of seaweed over one bushy eyebrow. Bring her over into the light, he directs and the fishermen heave their burden at the centre of the lobby. Mr Mollus, can't you make yourself useful and send to the kitchen for a large serrated knife? And who is this person in need of urgent medical attention? Who is so hopelessly tangled in the old fishing net? Well at first I think it's another fisherman, mostly because of the Wellington boots and wax coat the figure is wearing. Also, the fishing net is surely a clue. A clue. But her? Almost all the fishermen in Erie are, well, fishermen. I rise up behind the desk slightly to get a better look, and Violet does the same. A kitchen boy, summoned by a snap of Mr Mollusk's fingers, hurries into the lobby with a big knife and a block of wood. The doctor takes it and begins carefully sawing through the net. There's a moment of hush as he works. Mr Mollusk, surrounded by a knot of hotel staff, stands to one side, while the group of grizzled fishermen loiter on the other, dripping and looking completely out of place in the lobby. Then the last rope is cut, and someone wearing many layers of coats, scarves and woolly jumpers rolls out onto the floor. On her head are at least three hats tied on with a piece of string. Mrs Fossil! Violet gasps. And it's true. Erion sees only one and only professional beachcomber is now lying in a pool of seawater and chopped rope on the hotel's marble floor. Wendy, says Dr Tlassi, crouching beside her and feeling for a pulse in her neck. Wendy Fossil, can you hear me? Mrs Fossil twitches, then coughs up a quantity of water and a few pieces of kelp. She nods in response to the doctor's repeated question, and a small smile spreads over her face. What's she got? Violet whispers to me. She seems to be holding something. Sure enough, Mrs Fossil's arms were wrapped around a large object, an object that is itself wrapped in her tatty old wax coat. Your patient lives, doctor, says Mr Mollusk with a sniff. All's well that ends well. Now, if you would kindly take this scruffy person home, I can get back to running a respectable hotel. Mrs Fossil, I need to examine you, says the doc, ignoring our mollusk completely. You nearly drowned. Please let go of that thing in your coat. What were you going down on the beach in this storm anyway? It's low tide, murmurs Mrs Fossil, weak and soggy from her ordeal. Low tide after a storm. Best time for beach combing. But it's not after a storm, is it? Says the doctor, sitting her up. The storm is worse than ever. You shouldn't have been anywhere near the sea in this weather. Aye. The fisherman nods in agreement as each other, as another crash of thunder makes its window, the windows rattle. But Doc, Mrs Fossil says, if I hadn't been near the sea, if I hadn't been down on the beach, I would have found, I would never have found. Found what? Mr Mollus demands interested despite himself. I wouldn't have found. Mrs Fossil's voice is no more than a whisper now. The greatest beachcombing treasure of my whole life. And with that she faints away. 
As she does, her arms fall to her sides, her coat slips open and something astonishing rolls out, coming to rest in the mass of car, a cut-up net and seaweed on the hotel lobby floor. It's a fish. But not a living creature. This is a fish made from aqua green glass, frosted over with age and by the sea, but still recognisable from its fine workmanship as a very large and very ancient looking fish shaped bottle. It's about two urns long and three quarters of an urn wide at its fattest. Give or take a whisker. Its mouth, a perfect circle, is stopped by a sodded looking seaweedy mass, and, and as we stare, the bottle does something amazing. It trembles. All on its own, it trembles and there's a brief flicker of light from somewhere inside it. Fascinating, says Dr. Talassi. How extraordinary. Predictably, it's Mr. Mollus who go gets over the strange sight first. Hmm, I don't see why. It's just a piece of old junk. Old junk? Now it's the doctor's turn to be outraged. Can't you see from the design how extremely old this bottle is? It wouldn't be surprised if it's a thousand years old. And besides, look. The doc points, but we're all looking at the bottle anyway which is quivering and flickering with light again. Oh, that's, that's nothing, says Mr. Mollusk, though he doesn't sound too sure. It's just shaking with the storm. The whole hotel is shaking with the storm. It's like there's something inside, says one of the fishermen in wonder. Aye, says another. Something inside trying to get out. In that case, it definitely needs to be removed from the hotel, Mr. Mollusk declares, noting with irritation that several more fishermen have drifted into the lobby to see what's going on before some horrible slimy glow-in-the-dark sea slug comes out and makes even more mess. We have our guests to think of. For once, I agree, says the doc. It can't stay here. I will have it brought up to the museum immediately. Mrs. Fossil sits up. No, she sputters. Oh, forgive me, says Dr. Tlassie. I was forgetting my patient. Bringing this amazing find to the museum can wait till... No, Mrs. F sputters again. Well, I won't let you take it, Doctor. I won't. I found it. It belongs to me, fair and square. I won't let you bully me into handing it over, no matter how extraordinary or historical you tell me it is. I'm keeping it, and that's that. But, it's the doctor's turn to splutter. But my dear Wendy, surely you can see that this is no ordinary beachcombing knick-knack. Knick-knack? Mrs. Fossil draws herself up straight and pulls the soggy hats from her head. That's just like you to call my treasures knick-knacks. My flotsoporium is just as good as your fancy museum, and all the things I have found have stories behind them. Even the little sea glass pebble or tired old rinsable spoon. But, 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 but nothing. Mrs. Fossil gets to her feet, her welly squeaking on the polished floor. I've been collecting messages in bottles on Erie Beach since I was knee high to a penguin, and I'm not about to let you snaffle such a fine and dandy one as this. This is not a message in a bottle, says the doc, standing himself and looming over the beach coma. If anything, this is a message on a bottle. What do you mean? I mean, take a look on the side. He bends down and taps the glass bottle with his finger. Can you see that? Have you an idea what that is? Everyone leans in to get a close look, though Vi and I have no chance of catching a glimpse of anything from this distance. It looks like writing, Mrs. Fossil blinks. Funny writing, on the side of the bottle. Funny writing, Dr. Talassi scoffs. This is an inscription in Eerie script. This is nothing less than the secret letters of an ancient fisher folk here on Eerie. At these words, the fishermen gathered their visibly, the fishermen gathered there visibly react and exchange expressions of surprise. As if choosing this very moment, there is an almighty thunderclap over the hotel, and the ground beneath us trembles. Flakes of brick and plaster fall from the lobby ceiling, and one of the grand arch windows cracks from side to side. Gargantis wakes, cries a fisherman. Eerie quakes, cries another. Gargantis indeed. Dr. Lassie turns his stern gaze on the fisherman, brushing plaster from his shoulder. The storm might be bad, but there's no need for superstitious nonsense. That's easy for you to say, Doctor, growls a wary old fisherman, stepping from the rest. But this is a dismal business. You said so yourself. Here is script. Mrs. Fossil looks confused. I've never heard of such a thing. Then by your own admission, the bottle cannot belong to you, says Dr. Lassie. Eerie script is the secret writing of St. Dismal himself, the first fisherman of Erie on sea, and so by ancient lore, this fish-shaped bottle belongs to us, says the wary fisherman, as he grabs it. And that is the end of chapter 6, so join me next time for chapter 7.